All right, Titus 1, and um, uh, our text tonight will be verses 10 through 14, but for the sake of context, again, let's, uh, let's go jump back to uh, verse 5, kind of remind us where we've been and where we're going. Uh, Titus 1, let's start in verse 5. Uh, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as, uh, as a, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, uh, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The, the uh, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Uh, wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may, be sound, they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us tonight as we look to your word. Help me to just uh, say what would be helpful this evening and that we'd have a clear understanding of the text and, and uh, the scriptures tonight. Help my mind to be clear. And I uh, pray that these people would be helped and edified for a time together tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, remembering the context uh, uh, of the book of Titus as we uh, dive into this portion, um, you know, uh, Titus really is, uh, when we consider the background for the, the, the book of Titus, as Paul sends Titus there to Crete uh, for the purpose to ordain elders in every city and to set in order the things that are, that are wanting, uh, it really becomes sort of a blueprint even for missions work. Uh, you think of missionaries, there are definitely different missionary models, uh, but one of them really is this model. As a missionary will go, he'll plant a church, and he'll put it in a, a national pastor, and he'll go to the next place. And, and uh, before long, he's kind of circuiting those churches and making sure things are in order and things are going well, and he's kind of coaching them. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the missionaries I shared the need for uh, uh, during our missions conference was that Barnabas ministry. That's kind of what he does. He goes to the churches, uh, some of these churches, underground churches, in the 1040 window, and uh, well, most of them are in 1041. Some of these churches are in places where it's illegal or hostile to the gospel. And he's challenging and he's helping these uh, pastors of these churches to stay true to the faith and to, to keep things strong and to watch out for false teachers and so forth and, and, uh, and coaching them in that regard. Paul did that largely on his missionary journeys, especially once he's already established the churches. He'd come back through and he'd encourage them to, to keep on going in their faith and to stay strong. And, and, uh, and so we see that a little bit here. Uh, Paul sends Titus to Crete, where there had been some established churches, uh, whether they were saved at Pentecost and went back uh, to Crete, or, um, or else uh, uh, were people saved maybe on a tit uh, uh, Paul's, one of his journeys where he went by Crete. Uh, either way, there were several churches uh, that were established, but they were lacking leadership. And, uh, and so a part of, uh, a part of what uh, Titus was sent to do was to set an order um, uh, to set some things in order, and for that order to be sustained, he had to uh, ordain some elders, some, some pastors, some bishops over these churches. So we see here the qualification of those pastors. Here are some men that you should look for. Here are some qualifications for that leadership. And then he goes into the job description. That's where we looked at a little bit last time, the job description. And primarily the pastor's job is to hold fast, to be faithful to the work. That is primary. About, amongst everything else, he needs to hold faithful to the Word of God. You know, I think a lot of the problems we have in churches today are because pastors got sidetracked with other things, good things, and they've become uh, uh, negligent in their duty to the Word of God. And, uh, and so a lot of other things take the place, and they start filling that void, you see. And so they're to hold fast without compromise. He is to teach and to preach the Word of God. So we saw that in verse number 9. And... Um, and the importance of, uh, you know, as we consider this, we come into this portion now. So, so here we see the qualifications, what to look for, his job, and then some of the importance of that job is to address some of the false teaching that have risen in these churches. And so, um, you see, there were some very deceptive influences that have come in, and uh, as we'll see here, 
well, as we'll see here in this passage, you're playing around back there. Uh, <laughs> and um, so he is again, uh, uh, so, so, so now we kind of have a little bit of the background. Look at verse number 10, uh, still in the introduction here, but we're kind of considering what, what we're about to jump into. He says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they have the circumcision. And notice verse number 11. This is kind of going to be key in our uh, passage tonight. It says, whose mouths must be stopped. See, we have to have certain men uh, with these qualifications, and they must have an understanding of the word. Uh, why? To what end? What purpose? There are some people that have come in, and they've taught some things that have that wreaked havoc on these churches. And what he's saying is, you need to go and, and, and shut up their mouths. You need to, their mouths must be stopped. Now, I will say this. I mentioned uh, last week, just because I think it's such a comical uh, fact of history as well as uh, this time of year being Christmas season. But I think about St. Nicholas and uh, when they were having uh, the discussion and debate about the deity of Christ, how, uh, how he punched the guy right in the mouth uh, who, was, who was denying the deity of Christ. And sometimes I feel like doing that. But let me just say that is not what this is talking about when it says stopping their mouths. As much as you want to punch the guy in the mouth who you're debating with, that is not how you stop him, okay? But, uh, but here's what it's saying. Their mouths must be stopped. We're going to see how to do that. But, um, but you know, uh, last uh, week we saw how the pastors will hold fast to the Word of God. Uh, boy, this is really... It's, I might because it's so close here. The, the clip broke, and so... Uh, here it is. We'll just let it dangle here. See if that helps. Um, I think just kind of bunching up. Uh, you know, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The pastor... Is, uh, is to be holding fast to the truth and uphol- uh, lifting up the truth and so forth. You know, you think about, you know, times we may have guest preachers stand behind this pulpit and uh, missionaries or evangelists might get in- invited in. But uh, let me say that they come at the invitation of the pastor. They come at the invitation uh, of the pastor who is, who is put in charge to feed the flock of God, uh, to, to care for them and so forth. And so, so this is all part of the, the, the church's soundness and faith and, uh, and being exhorted and helped in the scriptures, uh, the feeding of the flock. And so when we think about all the things that take place, it all comes back to are we growing in the word. And so, so this is very foundational and part of the blueprint of a New Testament church are the things that Paul is addressing here. And he's saying, look, we need to establish some leadership, that they be sound in the faith. Why? Because when there is a void, let me just tell you, the devil will find some people to fill the void. He'll find some people to come in. I remember uh, years ago, there was a, uh, there was a missionary in, um, in uh, Rosarito, Mexico. And, um, and this kind of began many of my journeys down to Mexico when I was in Southern California. And, uh, but this pastor had uh, built a, a large ministry and several church plants, uh, went out from that church, that work. Well, the pastor, as well as his son, I don't know what the issue was, but there was some sort of sin. I don't know if it was mishandling funds, embezzlement, whatever it was. But, but anyways, they, they, they fell out of the ministry. So there was a huge void for a lot of the, the support of a lot of these churches. And I, we got word that several of these churches had um, uh, some of the, the Pentecostals actually uh, swept in there and grabbed a hold of them. And they, they went from being good Baptist churches to, uh, to falling into the charismatic movement and, and other things. And so... So uh, a pastor uh, that I was working with at the time, uh, uh, he and some other men, we decided we were going to go down there and just visit and encourage some of these churches uh, that were either extensions or had been influenced somehow by this church where the pastor had, had fallen. And, um, and so we went down there, and, uh, and we were very encouraged by the ones who weren't swept up. But, uh, but, but the point is, we were very concerned because when there's a void, when there's an issue taking place like that, uh, the devil will find something to fill that void. And that's what was going on. There was a lack of leadership. So some people were coming in, and they were subverting. They were, they were going in, and they were wreaking havoc in these churches. In Acts 20, verse 28 through 30, the Bible says, Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise. Of your own selves. Talking about these leaders, if you would, that were already in this position or these people within the church congregations. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Now, let me just say this. A pastor is doing his job right, is making disciples of Jesus Christ. A false teacher is going to be making disciples of himself. 
is no longer follow me as I follow Christ. It's follow me. And, uh, and, and so we need to be so careful. And that's what these people were doing here. That's what Paul warned about there in Acts. He said, listen, after I go away, after my departure shall grievous wolves. By the way, when there's a Paul figure, when there's someone like Paul in there, the grievous wolves are going to step, are going to keep their distance. When Paul steps away, they're looking and they're watching for an entrance. This is why it's so important that we must have strong men in the church. This is why it's so important that we must have, have people that are sound in their faith. Because these wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock. By the way, the answer to that, and of course, these are uh, metaphorical wolves. They're not actual wolves coming in. How do you get rid of a wolf? You, wolf, you just shoot them, right? Uh, but, but it's not with violence here. The situation is this. He says, I want you to feed the flock of God. Why? After my departure shall grievous wolves enter in. What will defend from wolves is being sound in the faith every time. You see, sometimes... We are not training our people to be sound in the faith, so what we do is we try to fight a carnal battle going after the wolves. You see, uh, the scriptures defend themselves. Paul likens the word of God to a two-edged sword, right? If you are good with your sword, you'll have no problem with the wolves. Um, but that is a big part of the pastor's responsibility, is to warn and to help people uh, in these areas. So his responsibility is not only to teach sound doctrine, but also to expose unsound doctrine. By the way, you need to. That's both sides of a coin. You need to teach sound doctrine, but also expose unsound doctrine. Now, I don't have to chase every heresy that's out there, but what you're going to find is certain heresies spring up in cycles. And so there are times where, where uh, there are the, there's the, the heresy of the week, okay? Or we have to go after, you know, there are going to be times where uh, you can look at even, even through, um, through recent church history where you'll see certain seasons where Calvinism just really comes up and starts gripping a ton of churches. There are times where maybe the charismatic movement's really uh, gaining some traction and, and sweeping up churches and, and so forth. And, and uh, we need to be sound in the faith. And, and whatever that flavor of the week is, the doctrine of the week, we need to make sure that we're saying, listen, guys, be careful of this. Beware of this. And so he is there. Uh, and by the way, I just want to say this. There's never been a more needful time for pastors to stand up and declare the word of God. Um, you know what's common today? Is preachers are standing up and making you feel good about yourself. Pastors are standing up and giving a self-help talk. And, uh, and it's, it's inspiring and it's encouraging. And there'll be, there may be times where I bring a message like that uh, to the pulpit. And there's a, you know, it's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you're getting, if that's your steady diet, and you're not growing in the faith, you're not growing in theology and how to study the Bible for yourselves, um, then, then you're going to be lacking. You're going to miss a lot of things. And most importantly, you're going to be vulnerable to these wolves to the smooth talkers. And we'll talk about this. I think you'd be, you'd be a little surprised on some of the character traits that God points us to. See, some think, so, so we have this calling, Jude talks about, mentions that we should be earnestly contending for the faith. Now, some think contending means being contentious. There's a, uh, there's a uh, um, uh, kind of a uh, comical or a parody uh, a Twitter account out there called... Um, uh, What's the title of it? It was, um, I can't remember the name of it. It's this, uh, it's this funny page. Uh, oh, um, oh, what is it? It's something, something fundamentals. But anyways, the tagline is contentiously contending for the faith. And, uh, and they put comical like memes up there and different things. But uh, uh, contentiously contending for the faith. Some people think that's what it means to contend for the faith. To be contentious for the sake of contention, uh, to be uh, to be mean and ugly, and you know we are to stand for the faith. But the Bible tells us that was once delivered unto the saints. A Bible-believing church is one that will contend for the faith. That includes teaching the faith. That includes standing up for the faith. That includes defending the faith. Um, but let me just say this: uh, being unkind for the sake of being unkind is still fleshly. You see, uh, we ought to let our speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. There are times where uh, things even might get a little heated, but, uh, but we are to be, uh, uh, and that's, you know, the flesh will come in even when you're doing something right for God. And uh, we ought to be on guard for, with that, but, uh, but nonetheless, we ought to stand for what's right. I mean, we live in a day and age where, where st uh, by the way, if you are dogmatic or you say something is right uh, without budging, by necessity, that means you believe some things are wrong. 
And in the day and age we live in where truth is relative, that's looked at by itself as unkind. And so we need to be, you know, you know all the more reason why we need to uh, have an answer and have an answer with the right attitude. But, you know, the cults, the cults are denying the sufficiency of Christ, or the deity of Christ. Uh, the charismatic movement with their extra revelations and their super, you know, their, their knowledge, their word of knowledge from the Lord or their tongues, uh, you know, all these things are creeping up. And people say, well, wait a minute, you know, my, uh, you know, Sister Sue has a word of knowledge and she wants to speak up in the church. I'm sorry, she's not going to. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you know, my, we, we have all these different things going on and we have to come back and say, wait a minute, but what does the Bible say? The faith once delivered unto the saints. And this is one of those issues. People say, well, how come there's no more apostles today? How come there's no more prophets? How come there's, a, there's these different things? Well, to put it uh, quite simply, when God ended the word, he, uh, he gave us this. By the way, some people will say, well, that's just for the book of Revelation. Here's what it says in Revelation 22. It says, um, uh, verse number 18, for I testify. By the way, this is one of the very last verses of the Bible. It says, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the, of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if a man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, uh, uh, which is, um, uh, excuse me, and out of the holy city from the things which are written in the book. And uh, uh, he was testified of these things, saying, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And so, so here the book of Revelation ends, and the, book of the, uh, the whole Bible ends with this thing. Hey, don't add to it. Don't mess with it. Don't touch it. You might say, well, that's just the book of Revelation. God doesn't want you to mess with that one. Interestingly, almost the exact verse, or very similar verse, is mentioned at the close of Deuteronomy. By the way, what does Deuteronomy represent? The books of Moses. Right? And so it's representative of that whole body. And same, similar to Revelation, it's the end, it's the cap, it's the bookend of all the books, uh, where we get the word Bible, it means books, um, uh, uh, bringing all this together, saying, look, it's done, God's revelation is complete, we don't need no uh, new revelation, we don't need a Joseph Smith to have a dream of an angel, we don't need a Muhammad to, 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 to be in a, tr uh, to, to a trance or, or uh, uh, have a seizure and come out with this knowledge, we don't need to have all these, all these uh, divine commentators like, uh, uh, what was her name, uh, uh, Ellen G. White, um, we don't need all these things. We have a thus says the Lord. And so we come back to the commitment of the pastor to hold fast the faithful words that he has been taught. So we see that in verse number nine, holding fast the faithful words that he has been taught, that he may be able to, with sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Verse 10, four, here's the reason why. There are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So, um, so as we unpack this, the first thing I want to point our attention to is there's a very problematic issue. There's a problem that is going on. These people are, uh, are, uh, are uh, they're unruly, they're vain talkers, they're deceiving. And so, uh, so when you think about this, these, these false teachers that are, that are prevailing at this time, that are prevalent at this time, many of them fall in the same category of what was being dealt with in Galatians. Uh, the Judaizers that were coming in with their Jewish traditions and trying to bring people back into the bondage of the law. Uh, there were different things that were different, different aspects that were going on here in Crete. As they were a little bit disconnected, there was a lot of the world that has made its way in and a lot of uh, immorality and various things that were happening. But, uh, but as we look at this, look at verse number 10, we see the spirit of false teachers. The spirit that's behind it. For many are, uh, uh, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. The first thing I'll point out is unruly and vain talkers. Unruly means they're rebellious in nature. That's kind of who they are. They would not allow themselves to be under any authority. They wanted themselves to be the authority. And so, so these were the kind of people that are deceiving others. Primarily, their first characteristic is, I will not have someone over me. In my, in my theology, over me in my, in my church polity, I, you know, uh, I must be the end all. I must be the authority. And so that's, uh, that's this group that they were. Um, there were many like this, and, uh, and it's a really, you know, they, they, they would not heed any kind of correction. That's the heart behind it, right? You go to correct them, they get bent out of shape, and they go along, right? Um, thankful for all the admonitions in the scriptures about being a wise person and taking correction well, right? Um, a wise man receiveth instruction, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, 
And so, so how important that is. And by the way, don't ever let your heart get to this place where you're not correctable, you're you know, not teachable, those kinds of things. None of us have arrived. Did you know, I've had to have conversations with people where, where, where they've pulled me aside and said, you know, Pastor, I think, you know, you didn't handle something well or, you, you know, maybe you're off on something. And, and, uh, and, you know, even though I'm in the position that I'm in, uh, I do not know it all. I'm still a student of the Word. And I'm still a student of trying to, trying to be a, a, a good and better leader in those kinds of things. And so what I'm saying is none of us have arrived, and we need to understand that God has established a structure. God has established a, uh, a, a system. That's not to say that I am the end all. Uh, in fact, I would say this. Uh, one of the signs of a potentially sound preacher is he is going to challenge you and point you to the word. Go see what, I, go see what God has to say about this, you know, and, and bring it back. We'll have a discussion if you're disagreeing still after some time in the word. You know, there was a dad, he was calling his son several times, and finally he goes to his son. He says, he says son, why didn't you come when I called you? And the, dad, and the boy said, well, dad, I didn't hear you. And he said, really? He said, and how many times did you not hear me? And he said, about three or four times. That's these guys, these unruly. You know, it doesn't matter how many times they've been instructed. It doesn't matter how many times they've been, they've been challenged. They will not hear. They, they, they are hard of heart and hard of hearing. Um, these guys were unruly. They're rebellious, and primarily they're rebellious against God's word. That's the character trait of these individuals. They're rebellious against God's word. They will not, they will not be under God's structure. So it shouldn't surprise you they will not be under God's word. They will twist it. They will, uh, they will make it say what they want to say. They'll take passages out of context, and they'll try to twist the scriptures until it fits their agenda. And then they start uh, with their smooth speech, with their smooth talking, start to bring people their way. These were vain men. It says that they're vain talkers. They're filled with vanity. They're smooth talkers. They're very influential, uh, but they did not have biblical substance. It, the word vain means empty. The spirit of these men was rebellious, and the content of these men was emptiness. That's, these were the kind of characters. And by the way, that's what you'll see. That's what you'll see. They'll creep into churches, and if, if they go unchecked, as was happening here, and the reason they needed some, some strong leadership, some guys to step in, it goes unchecked. Uh, they'll take over an entire church, or they'll split a church. And that's what takes place. You see the speech of these false teachers. Look at verse 10 again. There are many uh, unruly and vain talkers. It says that they're talkers and deceivers. Interesting thing. There it says they're talkers. One of the characteristics you're going to find of false teachers or deceiving teachers is that they do, they do a lot of talking, but they do little doing. These were talkers. They were talkers. Uh, I like to call them armchair theologians. Everything is from back here, from their position, from, from, from right here, right, behind a desk, and they're blogging. And they're doing all these things. By the way, there's nothing wrong with blogging. I have a blog, right? There's nothing wrong with these kinds of things. But if that's all you ever do, you know, I am God's gift to, uh, to the church, and it's my job to blast all the bad teaching in every single church that pops up. I'm telling you, you're, you're, not doing, <laughs> you're not doing the Lord's work at that point. You're talking, but you're not doing. Uh, there's a missionary out there, and I, I'm a little torn because he writes a lot of good content. I just don't think his spirit's right. And he, uh, while he's taking missions dollars and he's on the mission field, he's sending out all these articles to all these churches about these different prominent churches and they're compromised because the music's not exactly how he thinks the music ought to be or the standards, dress standards aren't exactly where he thinks they ought to be. And he's, he's like, you know, God's gift to fundamentalism. And I'm like, who, do you, who died and made you pope? Why don't you go win a soul while you're on the mission field? That's what they're sending you there to do. And he's taking these mission dollars and using stamps and all this stuff and sending out these mailers. I'm like, what are you doing? They're talkers, and they're doing a lot of talking, but they do little doing, and that's what you're going to find. They're vain talkers. I didn't say they're vain servants. You're definitely not going to see that. They're talkers. They'd come along inside these Christians, and they'd pull them away with their smooth talking. Turn over, if you would, hold your spot there. Turn over to Matthew 12 real quick. I'll have you look at a couple of passages here. I want you to see if Jesus dealt with some of these guys in his day. Matthew 12. <clears throat> I'm 
to get there, say amen. Okay. See, in this size, I know how many are there because there's just a small number. <laughs> uh, Matthew 12, look at verse number 34. Jesus is addressing these Pharisees. He says, O generation of vipers, how can ye be an evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bring, bringeth forth evil things. So it's even deeper than the content that's being shared. What is the overflow of the heart, right? These men were unruly and they were talkers. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. He's challenging these guys that, listen, uh, God's going to bring this back to your memory. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. He's going to use their own words to convict them, basically. And so, so, so this is an assessment God, Jesus was giving to these Pharisees who were not followers of God, were not believers of Christ, and, uh, but they were deceiving God's people. They were turning them uh, away. These guys at Crete, they were just talkers. They were deceivers. Uh, they were not soul winners. They were not peacemakers. They were talkers and deceivers. They were not servants. They were not Sunday school teachers. They were talkers. They were deceivers. They weren't doing stuff. They had a lot to say, though. One person once said this, a critic is someone who will tell you how poorly you're doing what they themselves are not even doing. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, the best answer to a critic is go out and do what God wants you to do. That's the best answer to a critic. See, these people, they were not doing the work of God. They were just talking to others that were trying to live out the work of God. Look at Romans 16. Romans 16. Are we all right tonight? Everybody okay? All right. Romans 16. Look at verse number 17. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, and get this, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Now, this is interesting. Oh, we shouldn't be judgmental. By the way, I've gotten criticism before for calling out false teachers. How, per se, would you call out a false teacher, or, or would you mark a false teacher without calling out their name? Spray paint, spray paint their car. Here it says, mark them. Let me just put that in our vernacular today. I'm going to say their names. Paul did this all the time, by the way. And I'm going to warn you. Now, in the day and age we live, so here's what it says. It says, mark them uh, uh, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Not just that they offended you, but contrary to the doctrine and avoid them. Now, in this day, in Paul's day, Many of these, these false teachers would be, would be maybe somebody that would travel from church to church or some way came into the church. Today, it, it, uh, you know, a preacher has to be on his game today because we have the Internet. We have published books, much more published than in their day. I mean, they had books, like scrolls. But today, I mean, I mean with, you know, really since the advent of the, the printing press, uh, uh, we've had this issue of, of influence beyond just the walls of the church, right? And so, uh, so we have to be on it. You know, what are the latest trends? What are the what's the the latest heretic that's gaining popularity? It's amazing some of the stuff out there that, that that's gaining that, that gains traction. Um, there are literally people out there today that have followings of hundreds of thousands, even into the millions, that are teaching that they are the second coming of Christ, and people are following them. Uh, one guy, he's, this, uh, he's a Hispanic preacher, uh, and his name happens to be Jesus. Uh, he believes he's the second coming of Christ. His wife left him when he started having these delusions that he was God. And he had a following of millions in, uh, in, uh, in Central America. You think, what well, in the world's going on? There's a guy right now in um, the Philippines who's a very charismatic speaker, and, and same teaching. He, he's, the, he, he's the second coming of Christ. And people are following all I'm saying is this, if we're not careful, we can very easily get swept away. By the way, what would, what would keep you from following me, following me, something like that? The word. The word. Every time. Okay? But, uh, but anyways, uh, so no, again, we're in Romans uh, 16 there. So we saw verse 17. It says to avoid them. Verse 18. It talks about who these people are. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like they do, but they don't. But their own belly. Say, so what does that mean? 
we'll preach for food. <laughs> no, it means uh, uh, the belly, that's the flesh. Their motivation is fleshly. Their motivation is something other than spiritual. And it says their own belly. And by good words, get this now, and fair speeches deceive the heart of the simple. You know, they'll come to you after the service. You know, that's, uh, that's nice preaching and stuff. But, but uh, you know, I know that's what that verse says. But let me just tell you, let me just take a minute of your time. You know, uh, uh, you know. You see, I, I, I've had an awakening. You know, I know a preacher means well, and I know he said, but I've had this revelation. I've had this awakening, this understanding. You see, I, I, I was wrong for 20 years. But God's shown me some things. And let me show you, and, and, and you know, uh, let me just talk to you for a while and, and how the pastor is wrong. Of course, they're not going to go to that pastor. But they'll pull you aside, you know. That, you know, that was nice. And I know pastor means well, but, uh, but let me tell you what I've learned. Let me, let me tell you why, why, why the, uh, taking a, a literal approach to Scripture is, is problematic. Let me tell you why Baptists are so wrong. Let me tell you why. And they, and they start going down these things because they have an agenda. They have some sort of axe to grind. And they have a different, you know, they don't serve the Lord Christ. They serve their own belly. Whenever there's a false doctrine... There are usually moral things going on, which we'll see later on in the text. There's usually some kind of moral thing going on. And, and, you know, in order for them to stop believing what they've been believing or to justify their behavior, they have to start changing some things. Wait a minute, I really think this, or I really want to be involved in this, or I really, you know, and we start, we start twisting things. We start changing things so it will fit our agenda or fit our lifestyle. See, these were not good men. The Bible calls them slow bellies, evil beasts, liars. And it's actually, it's actually quoting a, uh, a lost Greek, uh, or a lost Greek uh, poet, you know, we'll get to that in a minute. But again, in, uh, in Romans 16, it says, look, mark them. They don't serve the Lord. They serve their own bellies. So we'll be back here in Titus. Uh, you know, I, I so often pray, especially for new believers. You know, it's not long. They're, they're excited about their faith. They're growing and everything. It's not long before, you know, they run into a co- co-worker or something. It's like, oh, you, you're excited about the Lord? You know the Lord? Yeah, let me tell you about some things. Let's have, let's have a Bible study. And they start giving you material. And they say, you know, let's have, let's have a talk. By the way, don't you love people who won't, won't, they won't go and win somebody themselves, but they want to steal somebody and try to bring them over to their cult. You see, uh, uh, this book will help you better understand your belly. You see, what happened was, God started, Christ started his church, and the church immediately fell into apostasy and was completely uh, uh, apostate. So God had to raise up a man named Joseph Smith. By the way, that's what they teach. By the way, try this on a Mormon sometime. When they start telling you about their book, their prophet, tell them, so, so you guys believe Jesus is a liar? No, we don't. We believe, you know, you know we, we do not believe that. No, no, you do. Because in Matthew 16, Jesus said to Peter, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you believe that the gates of hell prevailed. Therefore, latter day, many, many years later, later, (laughs) uh, God had to raise up this prophet and try to bring it back on course. Apparently, the gates of hell prevailed. God's word, when the canon was closed, was not sufficient. You believe God's a liar. You see, anyways, you come across these coworkers and they'll say things like this. Oh, you know, that's great, but let me tell you about the full gospel. The full gospel, as if John three sixteen wasn't enough. You see. By the way, as a church, we had to pray for the simple. We had to pray for the new believers and so forth. The, 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 and because they're the ones that are the target. They go and they deceive the hearts, they deceive the minds of the simple. And so, that, so this is the people we're dealing with. They're talkers. First of all, they do a lot of talking, not a lot of doing. Second of all, they're deceivers. The word there, the idea is they're seducers. They're trying to trick people. They deceive them. And uh, Paul gives this warning often. Uh, Peter gives this warning. Look at, uh, look at 2 Peter 2, or towards the end of the Bible there, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2.
want you guys to see some of these passages. 2 Peter chapter 2, and look at uh, verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Notice how they do it. These false teachers are gonna, aren't going to come and stand behind this pulpit. They'll privily do it. You know what they'll do? They'll pull you aside. They'll say, hey, why don't you come over to our house after, after church, and we'll get to know each other. We'll have some pizza, and we'll get to know each other. And you think, oh, this is wonderful. This, this family's wanting to connect with our church family. Be careful now. Now, I'm not against fellowship. I'm not against pizza. Okay. But they'll do this. One notable group that does this are the, are the Rucknanites. I remember my first pastor, we had to chase off this group of Rucknanites because that's what they were doing. And they'll, they'll have you into their home, and they're, 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 they're a good family with high standards, and they all dress right, and they look right, and they're faithful in church. And like, man, this is great. They're, you know, and they're connecting with the church family, and then they start pulling out some DVDs. Let's have some Bible studies in our home, and let's, let's see what Dr. Ruckman has to say. And next thing you know, they show up to the, and in case you're not familiar with who that is, uh, he, he basically taught that the, he knows better now, he's in heaven. Um, uh, but he, he basically taught that, uh, that the King James uh, translators were re-inspired, that, that the King James Bible actually corrects the Greek, and you know, it's more accurate than, anyways, and, uh, and what they'll do is they'll get a, they'll get a posse together, and then they'll go to the pastor. Now, I don't think necessarily that Dr. Ruckman taught this aspect, but that's how zealous many of his followers were. And they'll come to the pastor, they'll say, Preacher, what do you believe about the King James Bible? And they'll say, well, I'm a King James guy. But, but are you King James enough? <laughs> and they'll try to run you off. And there's a guy that did this, and we had to boot him. And uh, what I'm saying is that, and now, now that's, a, that's a light thing. Honestly, you know, hey, we all believe the King James Bible is the word of God. Why don't we just stick with that, okay? Uh, you know, we really have to, you know, start fighting over this, uh, these uh, uh, fine details. But, but on that same level, though, they'll come in. They'll knock on your door. And they'll say, you know, hey, we're just finding some people that we'd like to have some Bible studies with. And, and here's where they really will get the stay-at-home mom. Oh, I'd love some company. I'd love to have some Bible study. And so they'll sit down, and they're having these talks. And they'll say, now, you know, we, we, we agree on the same stuff as your church. You know, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they start talking about how Jesus is a lesser God. And that Jehovah is the only real God. And they insert the name Jehovah all throughout the, uh, uh, every time the name God shows up. And, and uh, by the way, the name Jehovah is a very selective name. If you do some study on the word Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses kick that word around so much. But it has a very reverential title for God. So they say, we believe he's the son of God. And so you challenge, but do you believe he's God the son? And at that point, they'll say, have a nice day. Okay? And they'll walk away. But, 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 but here's what I'm saying is they'll come in and they'll try to deceive the simple and they, with their smooth speech and so forth. And so what is it? their goal? They're trying to deceive others. I told you there in Second Peter. Uh, it says they'll come in privily. This is not a public thing. They're going to do it privately. She'll bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. And, and through covetousness, ah, there's their motivation, through covetousness shall they with uh, feigned words, that means they're faking it, make, uh, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, but their damnation slumbereth, uh, excuse me, slumbereth not. It's coming. See, it was a problem then, and, and Peter was warning, it's going to be a problem today. And, um, uh, you know, not... not uh, by the way, let me just say this. Not every building that has the, name, the word church on the sign is telling you the truth. Not every Bible study you're going to attend is going to be helpful. What I'm, uh, what I'm saying is there's truth, there's error. And, and unfortunately, you know, uh, I was talking with Nick the other night about this. Uh, um, you know, it's amazing how all of Christianity says they believe the Bible. And I'm using Christianity as a very broad word. You know, the Catholics say they believe the Bible. The the non-denominational, the charismatic, you know, they all say, but then why do we teach such different things? Well, what is your approach? How do you use it? Are you twisting it? Are you deceiving with it? Are you, uh, you know, what is it you're doing? Or are you just going to the plain text? Let 
The Bible challenges us to try the spirits with the leader of God. Philippians 1 tells us to let our love abound more and more with knowledge and wisdom. That, that's the idea of discernment. So Paul was saying to Titus, he said, Titus, you've got a big job here. There's a big job before you. There are these churches that are, don't have leadership, not, not formalized, not established, and so I need you to go and ordain, and I need you to set in order. There's some things that are going on, and these men need to have a little bit of backbone. These men need to have some understanding of the scriptures. Why? Because there are some people that have come in, and they're splitting the churches. They're leading the churches astray, and they're with their smooth talk and their own agendas uh, wreaking havoc in these churches. So we see the problem. Then Paul starts bringing about, so here's the response you're called to bring. Here's the proper response that you ought to approach this with. Verse number 11. Whose mouths must be what? Stopped. Titus 1.11. Whose mouths must be stopped, put to silence. Um, you know, and there's a, uh, let me just say, there's a, there's a lot of, um, oh, let me just move on. Their mouths must be stopped because they are subversive. Look at it again, verse number 11. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Subvert. It's the idea that they'd go in and they would isolate families. Or they'd separate the, the, the husband and the wife. And, and uh, listen, this happens all the time. Maybe, maybe the wife is, uh, is on fire for the Lord. She's wanting to do stuff. But the, the, the father or the husband is maybe a little discouraged. And so people will kind of see that. They'll recognize that. And they'll start pulling them away and questioning things. Uh, and uh, they'll, 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 they'll separate. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll cause divisions, if you would. They'd split these things up and, or, or, and, uh, and, and, and challenge in such a way that the unity is broken. And, and that's what they'll do in these churches. By the way, notice what it says there. It says uh, they subvert whole houses. That does not mean they're necessarily coming into your home. Where do you think these churches in Crete were meeting? In houses, right? Uh, sometimes we like to have our modern you know, thinking of church and we you know, superimpose it on there. Most of the churches you come across in the New Testament were house churches. Most of them, okay? In fact, big building churches didn't come along until probably about another 100 years later. And... Uh, and so that's why the Bible talks about if someone, you know, someone comes into your house with another doctrine, don't wish them Godspeed and all that kind of stuff. Don't let them into the house. It's talking about in the church setting. It's not saying if you have a Mormon relative, he's not invited to Thanksgiving. Right? But he's saying be careful who you're going to let in the pulpit. Be careful who you're letting into the congregation to teach these other doctrines. And so these people, they're isolating people and they're splitting them up. You know, God is not the author of confusion. When people are bringing in confusion, they're stirring things up. Uh, understand, that comes from something else. It says they subvert. The word there, subvert, it's a compound word in the Greek, and it really it means to overthrow from within, from, from in the midst. And that's what they're doing. They're, they're overthrowing. They're overcoming the doctrine. They're causing these divisions, causing these splits. I may have turned to another passage, 1 Timothy, just to the left of a couple pages. 1 Timothy 6. Verse 6, verse number 3, says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but, uh, but uh, doting about questions and strifes, uh, uh, strife of words, uh, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men, uh, excuse, uh, men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness and from such withdraw thyself. You know, it's interesting. These people, they'll, uh, they'll have this mentality. Well, I can't be right. Look how, or I can't be wrong. Look how blessed I am. That's what the Pharisees thought, right? They thought, that's why they like to have all the gold and all that stuff because I, this means I'm blessed of God. And if I'm blessed of God, that means I'm right with God. If I'm right with God, that means I have the right message. And so, so uh, you know, I, I, ha I was talking to somebody one time about this thing of tongues. And they brought up some big preacher or whatever. And, and they're like, well, he has, he has thousands in his congregation. How many do you have, 50? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the measure of truth. How big my congregation is, is how right of a pastor I am. Okay? Uh, in that case, Jesus was less right than I am because he had 12. <laughs> but, but anyways, 
uh, you know, but that's the kind of supposing that gain is godliness, supposing that, that the, these things. But notice what it said, that, uh, that if any man teach not these things, the doctrine, which is according to godliness, notice this, he is proud, not knowing anything. It is amazing how when we assert our own ideas, our own thoughts onto the scripture, let me just say the root of that is always pride. It is always pride. I've got some deeper revelation, or I've got some deeper relationship with the Lord that I know better than what has been established, the doctrine that is according to godliness. And so this is the path, this is the motivation that is behind them. Uh, there's pride there, there's, uh, there's, there's gain. There, they want to, to uh, it says that they make merchandise and so forth. Listen, it's wrong for someone to come into a place and just and completely undermine their set of beliefs. Um, you don't go into someone else's house and tell them how to run things. I, uh, years ago, I heard about uh, there was these, uh, a group of Mormon, Mormon missionaries. You know, they've got pimples over their face and they have a name tag, Elder. And um, they were visiting, they kept visiting this Baptist church every Wednesday night. They were taking these field trips. And they were wanting to talk with the people after they dismissed. And it was a large church, so they kind of blend in. And they'd try to talk with people. And so, uh, so the pastor, since there were so many, they were scattered, he didn't know who they were because they hid their name tags. Uh, he decided to start just preaching against uh, Joseph Smith from the pulpit. And one night, he just let him have it. And he was talking about these people having their little field trips, trying to teach. And he started talking about the deity of Christ and the false prophet uh, Joseph Smith. And he's just going on and on. They didn't come back the next week. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, and of course, you know, I mean, he was preaching the gospel. And he was, uh, you know, salvation is not of works. You know, you can't become a god through these things. Uh, there was only one god, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and so forth. But, uh, um, but, you know, it's amazing how someone can read, uh, you know, can, can be sound in the faith, can, can maybe have a good upbringing or a good growing up in church, and, and then they'll read one book, not, not the book, but they'll read one book. Oh, this book changed my life. I feel such liberty and freedom now. And they're falling into some sin, and they're falling out of church, or they're just by, There was a guy who used to be a pastor. And he wrote a book on why the local church is no longer for today. And he had the nerve to, to give it to other pastors. It's like, you know, this, this teaching would make me, first of all, I would lose my job, which is no church, right? But even beyond that, you know, uh, okay, I'm sorry. You know, and, and, of course, in the book, it was all about just him being hurt and getting disgruntled and all this kind of stuff. But... Um, but, uh, you know, it's amazing how people will, will not hang on to the scriptures. We talked about that, uh, you know, how, how people will, will flood into to these books about their experience of heaven. My, my 90 minutes in heaven. And they'll write a book about it and be a bestseller. And the same people that are buying up that book will not open this book. They'll not crack the pages of scripture. So I always get a little, like, leery, like, oh, this book changed my life. Now, there's a lot of books that had a huge impact in my life. I like what Spurgeon said. He said, uh, he said, visit many books, but live in this book. Live in the Bible. And we ought to visit many books. We ought to live in the Bible. And, uh, and uh, what I'm saying is they'll come out completely different. Their mind's made up from some guy, and they'll ignore inspired scripture. These men want to talk about their, their little differences, people, but they'll never want to talk to the pastor. You see, what I'm saying is this book, Titus, is very relevant because these were the things that were going on, and they were splitting churches, they were leading churches astray, and they were bringing in these other things. Maybe there was a hurt somewhere along the way. Maybe there was, there was one thing or another thing that led them to just completely abandon what God had already laid out, what God had already said, the doctrine, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. You know, I'm very thankful for the compass of Scripture. He just stuck with that. See, a false teacher always has a little something extra. Now, John 3.16 is good, but, but what? I mean, what part of shall have everlasting life do you not understand? Let me tell you the full gospel. Let me tell you the five-point gospel. Let me tell you this gospel or that gospel. Dr. David Cooper used to say, When the plain sense of Scripture makes good sense, seek no other sense. And others have added to that, lest it be nonsense. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so often, you go, well, let me get to the deeper meaning. Let me tell you what that says. You know, such a, um, uh, there's no need to find some deeper meanings to the plain teaching of the Word of God. 
such an approach to the Bible uh, enables a quote-unquote student to really find anything that they're looking for. If you have some kind of agenda, if you have, by the way, you know, I can, I can point to you to articles online on uh, why we shouldn't pray anymore. And they'll show scripture. Or why we shouldn't pray corporately as a church. That was actually a discussion I had in a church with somebody, a deacon. We shouldn't have corporate prayer. Look at this article. I think we should have corporate prayer. Look at this passage. <laughs> and um, you can find just about anything. Um, why, why women should be pastors. See, these people, they were subversive, uh, and there was a false pretense. Look at their, their reasoning, their motivation. Let's get back to Titus. We're in Titus 1. So they, they, it says their mouths was he stop. Here's what they do. They subvert whole houses. They teach the things that they should not. What's their motivation? For filthy lucre's sake. There's the pretense. There's what's behind it. Warren Wearsby said this. They were not ministering to the church. They were using religion to fill their own pockets. This explains why Paul said that not given to filthy lucre was a requirement for an elder. A true servant of God does not minister for personal gain. He ministers to help others grow in the faith. Their God, their, you know, this is what, what Paul was saying in Romans. They don't serve the Lord Jesus, but their own bellies. These guys were lying in their own, their own uh, pockets. Uh, I had you there in 1 Timothy 6. Let's go back there again real quick. 1 Timothy 6. We stopped in verse number 5. talks about from such withdraw yourself from, from these kinds of guys. They're proud knowing nothing. Um, in fact, let me, uh, let's see. In verse 5, it says, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Verse number 6, for godliness with contentment is great gain. That's where you find the great gain. Verse 7, if we brought nothing into this world, then it's certain we should carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be, uh, they that will be rich fall into temptation. That's kind of interesting. They that will. It's a matter of the will. If that's your passion, if that's your desire, that's what you're pursuing. They that will be rich fall into the temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And by the way, it's no different for a preacher. It's no different for someone who's trying to teach the word. If that is what you're after, if that's your motivation, you will fall just as easily. Verse number 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. By the way, it doesn't say money. The love of money is the root of all evil. While, uh, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Well, that's what's going to happen. While you covet after, while you're pursuing it, it will cause you to err from the faith, cause you to start compromising, cause you to start changing the things. They erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In other words, uh, enough is never enough. There's always one more dollar to be made. There's always this, there's always that. And notice next uh, thing, uh, verse number 12, back in Titus 1, verse number 12. This was a known pattern they established. So we see their motivation. It was money. Verse number 12, here's their pattern. Of themselves, even a prophet of their own said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Those false teachers, uh, this, these false teachings were coming from Jewish believers. These were of the circumcision. These were those that they were Jewish uh, believers. And what's interesting is Paul was quoting a Greek poet uh, by the name of... Um, uh, uh, Ep Epimenides, I, I can't even say the word, um, but, uh, but he was one of their uh, poets. And uh, what's interesting was this was a stereotype of those in Crete. The, the stereotypical Cretan was, uh, was exactly what was laid out there, and what he's saying was, you guys are falling into this thing that is stereotype, uh, stereotypical of this place. So he's kind of bringing their own philosophy. He's then bringing their own philosopher to convict them, if you would. He says, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And that's what they fell into. That's who they were. And so we see here Titus's mission. Titus was sent here to straighten up these churches, to strengthen and set in order the things that were lacking. And uh, why? Because uh, Titus, uh, Paul was telling Titus, listen, it's a crooked culture. There's all kinds of wickedness. Even, uh, even their main god from there was Zeus, and he was a liar. He was a cheat. He was immoral. And that's how the people were. And because there was this leadership void, there were many that, that were giving way to these false, seducing false teachers. They were pulling them aside because there was a spiritual void there. So he had to challenge them. 
Uh, he, challenged, he said, he said Titus, when you go there, you ordain these elders. You find those that are qualified. And no doubt as he ordained them, and as they went through the qualification, and maybe he challenged their doctrine. He wanted to see where they stood on things. And he sat down. They ordained them. And then I can just see them come Monday morning. He had some meetings with these guys. He said, guys, I want you to understand some things. I know what's going on in these churches. I know what's taking place. I know what the struggle is. There are some people that are coming in. And they're, they're bringing about questions, and they're causing people to question their faith. They're bringing about some compromises. They're bringing about flat-out heresies, and they're challenging you in all these different areas. And he said, guys, here's what you need to do. You need to shut them all up. You need to stop their mouths. How would you like to have that as your first task as a new pastor? <laughs> if I had time, I'd tell you some of my first tasks. i tell you what, I was thrown into the fire in some, some ways. Whose mouths must be stopped. See, these people, they'll come in and they'll say, you know, you, know uh, uh, you can just see what was going on as he ordained them, and they're going out to these churches. I can just see the people. Who do these preachers think that they are? Well, we'll see that even today. You know, you stand up and you're preaching on truth, and you're preaching on what's right. Who do these preachers think that they are? Well, they're preachers. Now, what do they think they're doing? They're doing what they were called to do, to preach. To lift up your voice like a trumpet and cry aloud and spare not and tell the people their transgression. What are they, you know, they're just, you know, no, 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 they're setting some things in order. Because Why? Because people are sneaking in and they're privately pulling people aside, subverting whole houses. They say, hey, let's come over to our house, let's have a Bible study. Hey, let's talk about this thing, that thing. You know, I know a pastor means well, but here's what that verse really means. Here's, here's what I've learned. You know, I believed, I used to believe just like pastor for, 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 for years and years and years, and, and, but now God's opened my eyes. Uh, that's, that one's kind of recent, fresh wound there. <laughs> when there is a problematic issue, there must be a purposed response. Very intentional. We have to address it. Remember the context of the book. Titus was set, sent there to set in order. Because there were some things lacking. And so when you look at these passages, you think of it like that. And you think, even just in our culture, there, there are some things that, that are pulling churches astray and, and things that are going on. And so the last thing I want to point out is this, the pastoral responsibility. Look at verse number 13, the pastoral responsibility. First of all, we see that the mouth must be stopped. Verse 13, this witness is true. Speaking of this accusation on these guys, that he says, look, that this, this proverb, this poet, you know, it's, it's about you guys. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to be tolerant. We're we supposed to love everybody. It says, take these people, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. That's an interesting thing. So here's the pastoral responsibility. Rebuke them sharply. In other words, cut that thing off. Cut it off at the pass. Get, address that thing, right? Now remember, they're not going directly to the pastor. They're not going directly to the leaders. They're pulling people aside. They're, they're sneakily going in there. So you go straight to them. Hey, how you doing? Bring, come, come around them. Let's talk. Rebuke them sharply. Don't, don't beat around the bush with this thing is what he's saying. So here's what, that, here's what that's about. When someone comes in, they're subverting. Uh, they subvert the word. They're subverting the, the church. It's my job as a pastor, it's our job, uh, even leaders in the church, to, to cut it off at the past and to rebuke them. Proverbs 25, verse 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. 1 Timothy 5, 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. To, uh, 2 Peter uh, 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Jude 3, beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you, the common salvation is needful for me to write to you uh, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so we, yes, we rebuke them sharply, but what is the purpose? To restore them. Look at verse uh, 13 again. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And let me just say this. When you are preaching the word, when you are faithful to the word and you're not pulling back any punches, you're just being sound in the faith. Here's what's going to happen. People that are coming are either going to respond or retreat. 
I remember one person was uh, given a case why we shouldn't be handing out tracts. What if a whole bunch of hell's angels show up? Like, wonderful. They need the gospel too. Did you know Christ died for hell's angels? I mean, not the actual angels of hell. I mean, the biker gang. Okay, well, all right. Let me define that. So Hell's Angels is a biker, is a biker club. All right. All right. Well, I hope you're found now. Okay. Yeah. So, so anyways, I, say, I said to him, I was like, well, you think they're just going to come and just take over the church? Either they will respond to what's being preached because uh, the Holy Spirit is convicting them, or they're going to run away from what's being preached because the Holy Spirit is convicting them. If I'm doing my job in preaching the word, now, I would be concerned if I wasn't doing my job and I was making them feel very comfortable and they're just one of the family without any conversion. That's problematic. <laughs> but, so here's these guys. Rebuke them sharply. There's going to be a response. They're either going to repent or they're going to leave. Either way, it's a win. Either way, it's purged. Either way, the congregation is helped. But first, we want to bring back the ones who've been subverted. We want to bring back the ones who've been, been, been uh, dealt with. And so, so we want to rebuke them. Why? For their sake. Hey, come back into the fold. I know they're pulling you away. I know they're was, there was making some distance happen. Let's bring them back. But also, we want to bring back the ones who are doing the subverting. Now, there is a limit. We're there in Titus. Look at Titus 3, verse number 10. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, rejects. Hey, if they're not going to respond to your, uh, um, to your uh, rebuke, then you need to reject them. And that's part of the shepherding aspect of dealing with wolves. Psalm 119, verse number 80, let my heart be sound in thy statutes and not be ashamed. We ought to be sound. And so when we're rebuking them, we take the scriptures and we show them uh, they, they, it's, it's to what end, that they may be sound in the faith. Hey, listen, a double-minded man is what? unstable in all those ways. And that's what you tend to run into. They're, they're, they're kind of at odds with the scriptures, with what they've been teaching. Let's bring it all back to the authority that they would be sound in the faith. Remind them. Bring them back to soundness. Not just win the argument, but you want to win a brother. And I think too often we just want to win the argument. But we want to win the brother. Galatians 6.1 uh, says, uh, If a brother be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And we want to restore them. We want to bring them back. See, these silly doctrines, these false teachings, they're the, the, the erring ways of immorality. Any one of us, by the way, could find ourselves falling down those roads, falling down those paths. And so what do we do? We want to restore them. But we also want to protect them from future Subversive attacks. The CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, they're known for going into other countries, and they, uh, they wear badges. They let everybody know. You guys, I want you to know that I'm just doing some recon, and I'm checking some things out in your country, and I just want you all to know that we're here in country. Is that how they do it? Yeah. No. <laughs> they blend in, right? Why? Because they have a secret mission. They're collecting data. They're wanting to not be noticed. You see, these people that are subvert, they don't come in with a sign over them. They don't come in with a badge. I'm the chief subverter. No, they're secretive. They seem godly. They're smooth in speech. We see that, right? They'll, they're very selective with their scripture usage, but they sound good. By the way, the devil uses scripture too, doesn't he? And he's rather selective with his use of scripture. He tried, to, he tried to use Scripture against Jesus, the Word incarnate. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jesus, throw yourself off the temple, for it is written. Of course, Jesus would turn things around and say, let's put things back into context. It is also written. Here's what it says. You see? We need to know the Scriptures. Look at verse number 14. We're almost done. We're in Titus 1, verse 14. <clears throat> So he says, uh, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Verse 14, not giving heed or giving over to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. These were things that were going on. They were Jewish fables that were taking place. 
and uh, and and uh, uh, you know, what does it say? And commandments of men. Boy, we I think we can see both of those going on there. Not necessarily Jewish fables, but fables and commandments of men. Here, have you ever heard this? Unless you do such or this, that, and the other thing, you're not right with God. Unless you're here every time the doors are open. No. <clears throat> should, you, should church be a priority? Church? Absolutely. Wouldn't you know that my, my standing with God is not contingent on whether or not I show up to church? And you call yourself a Baptist. I almost missed church tonight myself. Cuts in right to the heart of the matter. You know, a true surgeon of the soul will cut only to bring a cure. He rebukes sharply. He says, listen, these things ought not so to be. What we want is soundness. And if you rebuke sh sharply and bring it back, uh, soundness will be the result. And it won't be given heed to these things that are just going to distract and pull this way or that way. And, well, what about this? You know, how about, why don't you focus on, we talked about this last time, uh, or maybe a couple weeks ago, focus on who you are with God before doing with, uh, for God, before what you do for God. Who you are with God before what you do for God. And we say, well, let's have some commandments of men in here. You want to be right with God? You want to you do this thing and that thing and that thing. And listen, I'm sorry. Uh, let's get things down to how they really are. How many commandments of the scriptures do I need to obey to be saved? Yeah, one, if you want to give us one, it's call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. All I'm saying is, is, is it's amazing the things that we kind of throw in there and we start to muddy the water. We fall into this stuff. You know, are there things, some things we've got to do as believers? Absolutely. We're going to be so careful. I'm not putting this emphasis on these commandments of men. Look at, uh, look at uh, 1 Timothy 14 real quick. Last place I'll have to turn. 1 Timothy 1, verse number 4. It says, Neither give heed to fables, that's what we're talking about there, and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. You know what these guys are doing? What about this? What about the, they, they, they want to bring up questions. They want to bring about these different fables. They want to bring about different, in this case, you know, with the Jews, they love their genealogies. They love, you know, and, uh, you know, even Paul brought that up. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, right? These genealogies, and, and we even see them all throughout Scripture, and now, scriptures, they definitely had a purpose, but even to, to this day, they're, uh, uh, they're real big about what tribe they came from or what you know, their genealogy was or, or whatnot. And, um, you know, so, so here's a guy, he's not a perfect Christian, but he's trying to live for God. He's trying to grow in his faith, and all of a sudden, there are these questions that start to cast doubt in his mind. They don't edify, they don't build them up. Uh, they're like, you know, hey, where, uh, where, where, did, uh, where did Cain get his wife? Huh, never thought about it. Let me, let me ask you. Did Adam have a belly button? And he's like, I don't, I don't know what the answer to that. And where do dinosaurs fit in the Bible anyway? Because don't you know they were extinct long before man came along? Oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, what about this? The Bible says that the, that the earth's a circle, not a, not a sphere. It's flat like a pizza. What a, if I believe every word, and, and uh, I found a good one the other day, right, Derek? Uh, what about the four corners? Tell me, circles don't have corners. What about the corners of the earth? Hmm, there we go. Anyways, and now we're like, do I believe every word? Do I not believe every word? I was talking to a guy one time. He said, uh, he said uh, the hill where Jesus died on, Golgotha, it means the place of the skull. What do you, what do you believe that is? He said, it's a hill, and it reminded people of a skull, so they named it after a skull. And I showed him a picture. You can actually see it today. From a, you zoom out, it looks like a giant skull. Oh, I believe it was a literal skull left over from after the giants were there. And I said, well, that's silly because there's no skull there. And he said, well, I guess you don't believe every word of the Bible. Okay, do you believe God's a bird? I mean, 
if, that's, if we're going to be that literal, do you believe God's a bird? I, I mean, I mean <laughs> at some point, you've got to bring some, some common sense into this thing, right? Do, do you believe Jerusalem, I'm sorry, Bethlehem, is a literal bread factory? Because it means house of bread. You name something a certain way. Anyways, I'm getting off track now. But then all of a sudden you're bringing doubts and you're, and like you're, you're missing, you're, you're majoring on the minors and you're minoring on the majors and you know, you're, you're choking on this thing. Next thing you know, you're discouraged. You start falling out. You know what's happening? They've subverted you. So you ought to defend the faith today in the context we live in. I mean, it's all around us. And, uh, and we need to be sound in the faith. And me as a pastor, my job, tell you what, I, I do have to be somewhat of a wolf hunter. And how do we fight wolves? It's not chasing after every potential wolf. It's feeding the flock of God. That we are healthy. That we, that we get into the meat. We're not just stuck on the milk and, and every little question, you know, oh, I better check with my pastor. Better check. And by the way, check with your pastor. You, you might be surprised to say, I don't have the answer to that, but I will get back to you. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, it's amazing how quickly we can just sort of fall into these, these uh, endless genealogies or these various things. But uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together tonight and for the word. Thank you for this, uh, this portion of Scripture. What, a, what an encouragement it is.